Yeah, so following on from Sue's uh, project management talk, we're just going to go into a bit of a panel discussion now, more of a bit of a workshop, a bit of an informal discussion, lots of opportunities to answer questions. We've obviously got clients here um, from many different organisations, many different types, who are at many different uh, stages of implementation, from from using it fully to, to haven't even begun yet and needing to implement this. So, Sue's, Sue's chat was very much higher level. We've got people down at the, the pro football clubs, we've got schools, uh, universities, and all types of stuff that, that may not need to go to those levels. So we've got an esteemed panel of representatives here who can um, answer any of those questions that you have. So we've got some questions prepared. Uh, we'll go through them. At any stage, uh, feel free to put your hand up, get some feedback uh, from our panelists as well. As we spoke about, every organisation needs their champions. We have their legends. The legends of the game, ready to go. So from AIS, we have Todd Ryle, our project manager in the middle, Brent Rogowski from West Coast Eagles, uh, Simon Harries from ARU, Steve Rosenhuber from Camp, and our own Sue Robson now. So, to begin with, how important is gaining buy-in from within an organisation? Todd, I'm going to ask you... Oh, tricky one. Let me finish. Uh, question, buy-in, organisation, all right. Um, Twofold in this one. Uh, so our buy-in, that started pretty early on, so before we even went with SmarterBase. Um, we done a lot of sort of like a tender process and request there. So essentially we had our buy-in before the project even started um, in terms of not just financially but understanding what our objectives were. Um, I think we had nine key objectives that we started originally. We've pretty much kept those nine for the course of the project. We've tried to change the scope a couple times but we keep coming back to the same nine that we originally started with. Uh, buy in so once the project was was going um, and keeping that keeping that consistent it's obviously hugely important but it's probably not too much around my role. Um, my role of the project management is more making sure that the people responsible for the buy-in have the information. Um, so we establish what's called a it's like a project structure board. Um, this is where we're assigning roles to people. So we have a, a project board made up of our exec. Uh, we have a senior user. Uh, we have a senior supplier. So someone from the Fusion Support on that. And that top level, they're the ones who I'm providing the information to, basically to make sure that the project's still on track. So from that, that creates my buy-in with the exec. Um, below that board level, we have a like a champions level, I suppose, like a prime contacts. Um, so we've got a representative from each of the CISAS, uh, we also have one for each of the sports and then internally the AOS uh, we'll have like someone who heads up uh, like the contact for nutrition, uh, for psychology, for physiotherapy um, and it's each of them that it's really their job to create the buy-in. If I, if I as a project manager go out and try to get sports to use it and all that, um, it's not going to work, no one really wants to listen to an IT project manager. So. Um, I really rely on those guys to create the, uh, the buying and the education back to me which I then report up to our board um, and we can basically track whether the project is on status or not. Yep. Yep. Uh, obviously you work with you know, many institutes, uh, all the sports, so Simon, you work um, at 4AIU but you also look after all the franchises, do you want to comment on how important buying is from your side? Yeah, so um, we haven't had the same level of executive support and probably it's just more of an organisational structure um, in, in that I report to my direct manager but the project doesn't really go much further than that. The buy-in has probably been trying to more get at someone in each of our Super Rugby franchises to become you know, a good user of the system and see its benefits and then try and promote that from within. Um, and that's probably a, a daily and weekly, you know, turnover of trying to establish buy-in and, and keep it going. Yep. And Steve, I'll ask you as well. Ours is a little bit different, um, where 
there's a, a committee in Canada that's made up of sports scientists and the sports medicine group, <clears throat> and they have about four representatives for each field, uh, mental performance, uh, medical, uh, physiology, nutrition, and those positions change. So we found that we had to make sure that our business plan is always up to date and to be aware of who is on that committee currently because they change every year it seems. So what will happen is you've got uh, four nutritionists who are really on board with everything and they understand what's going on and you've got a plan but the problem is the next time that committee comes up two of those nutritionists have left and there's now a new one and there's a new person in charge and for some reason they've been in a place where they've never used the software before. So they don't know anything about it, they don't know what it, what it does, there's, uh, there's no history behind it, so we have to continually keep that education piece up and make sure that the heads of each of those different uh, committees knows what the system is set up to do. Uh, otherwise they forget about it and they don't consider it to be important to continue to trickle that down through their departments. Okay. Yeah. So does anyone have any other questions about how to gain buy-in from your organization? Moving along there. So what scope was identified and how did or has this scope differed from your original plan? So, Frank, as a, as a single club, what yep. scope did you identify to begin with? Uh, so about four years ago we signed up uh, to Spinal Base. And essentially, we just wanted um, one system that just centralised all our data, just so our sports scientists, our physios, um, our head strength and conditioning coach could just all access the same data. Um, we had Excel spreadsheets everywhere, and that was very problematic, um, uh, especially when we we're travelling as well. So when we're on the road, um, uh, every two weeks we wanted everyone to have access to up-to-date data. Um, so essentially it was just centralisation of data. Now we're slowly moving towards um, predictive analytics um, and that's where our Smarter Base project is slowly moving. So, yeah. Tom, I'm going to go for you again. Uh, scope, yeah, so it, it touches what I was referenced before. Um, our scope goes from, we're probably a little bit more formalised being government department things and to actually get money to implement we need to get business cases approved uh, through the finance and then other oversight committees so uh, our scope originally we started with nine objectives a lot of it was around injury management so getting better injury management better medical management um, once again centralization of, of data as Brent uh, mentioned um, there was things like whole range of sort of data objectives but we also had this last one this number nine around this predictive analytics component which we're sort of get to now um, so our scope originally was sort of ticked off some of those eight we've done a two reviews on it and this is maybe part of the problem of um, smarter base is that it's sometimes too flexible and you find lots of requests coming in from from other users um, we've had requests for to turn it into a HR system to replace even parts of the finance system. Um, appointment system was a good one earlier we looked at. Uh, we've had people who want to use it for a whole range of things that you can do with it, but we also try to just bring it back on scope again. Uh, so, we, in, yeah, in answer to the question, our scope's pretty much exactly what it was two years ago when we started. Uh, we've still probably got another year or two until we get there also. Yeah. And Simon, when we were talking about before, you also said you went through a, a large scoping period at the start of your project. Yeah, um, so I kind of got thrown into this job in January and I, I wasn't really aware of the whole process. So I, I attempted to go through what Sue was talking about and, you know, create a scope document, understand all the stakeholders and marks it, etc, etc. But things I wasn't really reporting to anyone in a structured way, I kind of moved away from that and just tried to get my hands dirty. Um, and you know, I've, we basically planned that we'd do X, Y, Z across the whole breadth, you know, of collecting information, you know, for a performance department. And we just made a decision that we wish weren't resourced at this time to do all those things. And we've narrowed our, our scope 
in the short term down to a very medical and physiotherapy and like workload scope and until that's sorted we're not going to deviate too far away from it and, and then we can open our scope up a bit more. So there's probably more resource dependent than anything else. Yeah, and so resources are big even just right from the beginning. Um, unless you have someone that you can, you can commit to the building and administration side, get everything up and running, it, it just, it's just an absolute critical part of the whole project. If it's not identified early, then, then I've found that, that you can end up with some troubles in, in implementing. Uh, Sue, do you want to comment any further on that? Yeah, I think I mentioned a few things in terms of the Institute's experience. I mean, they're in, in a place now that they're four years down the track and they've got a pretty good, functional, complete, integrated system. They're just now in a place where they're opening up that to a lot of sport access, athlete access, and then scoping out what the needs are on the, the planning and um, linking in the performance markers, KPIs, and actually it's a piece that originally was done in a, um, there's a portal that's used and it's just documents. And it's effectively just a catalogue of documents that um, the various departments and sports and the, the managers for each sport can push in their end document of what their year plan is, what their objectives for the next year, that's linked to the funding of the NGBs, etc. And now the request is and the scope is around actually putting that in as a proper data set in Smartverse and then linking that into the other pieces that are there. So where there is uh, medical, physiotherapy, etc., that that can now time allocate, it can link to core objectives of the business. Um, they're looking at ways of developing sports as athletes so that you can actually catalogue and report on sports and sport outcomes associated with that. So but they're now in a stage where they're scoping that next, what's, what's the next stage, and they see Smarterverse as being a core piece that can then add that value and link it into the other data sets that are there. Yeah. So that's quite a, a change from what was there before, but is only able to go there because this piece is, is, is reasonably complete. Yeah. So it, it is good that um, I think it's good that our smart base sites, they, they basically can always be in a constant state of development, really, and it's just a, a matter of rescoping and continuing on with the next building. Can I just say, <coughs> there, there are actually three other things because they're linked to the APIs that have gone on in the other presentations. The other side on the development side is actually linking in performance software straight into SmartBear, so the automation of those processes is, is one of their performance piece sports. Yeah. Any further comments from anyone? Carol? Uh, yeah, I have a short question. Um, just because of the work I'm doing with some of my clients. Um, when is a good time to change scope? How do you decide that you need to change scope when it's a good time to go? Because from my experience, sometimes waiting for the original vision to be completely achieved is either unrealistic or uh, you might miss opportunities to address particular issues that you might have to deviate from that that are important and you think would be a good time to address them. So, how do you make a decision that you can increase your scope? How do you make a decision that, okay, this is completely off the board, but we are going to do it anyway? Have any of you had that experience? Welcome, Nancy. Well, yeah. um, that came up probably a couple of months ago for us where we have this, this new performance investment unit, so it's all about tracking the funding of the athletes and comparing against you know their performance results. So um, this is where it was important for us to have that, that structure with that exec. So scope's fine to change, and you can change it. Um, and it's, your business case is there to be reviewed, so scope can change. But we need um, basically the priority of that change coming through. So performance investment wants to track NSOs, um, so sports, and track the performance and the investment going in against that. So it was out of the original scope. So it gets prioritised with the other ones. But then it's really up to the people who have the vision and the, the cash, our exec, to decide where the scope should change. So 
that got presented up in our monthly project board meeting um, was hit on the head basically because they looked at the current scope and prioritised it not as high as the other ones. Um, it's basically parked, it's not eliminated, but it didn't have the importance in terms of priority for the other ones. Um, so you want to provide an avenue, I suppose, to to continue to receive those those new scope items, and you don't want to eliminate them completely. Um, but I guess there's evaluating the time and place of when you should be working on that and when you shouldn't. So. I have one for you, girl. It came up from um, the nutrition program. Uh, it's a little while ago that it came up, and it was to do with a food diary that they had and a great honking date burst that they'd been trying to get an app running on a mobile phone with probably two years' investment of it, and they. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't even know about it and it came in, I think Peter and I were having a meeting, oh, we're trying to do this, have you got any avenue for that? Just just show us exactly what you've got and how you can do it and we built the page and the capability and the app within I think about 30 minutes or so for them and had it up and running the next day and so which was almost embarrassing as to how simple it was so you know sometimes there are things out there that might not be in the original scope but it just sits straight down the smart base avenue in something that it does so easily and so quickly that it's a no-brainer yeah we can do that for you and we can have it ready for you for tomorrow. It's better resources either you have the resources to place but what's important or it's so easy that you actually just can't help it. Yeah, exactly. And the winds are so big compared with the not, not doing why would you not do that? So it's, yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, what if you didn't have an initial scope, but simply that you identified the need for a single repository of data? Yeah, you do a needs analysis for sport, you get your bones built, you populate them, and then you ask questions as what are the risks? I think um, we're probably in a good position to answer that because we didn't have a scope from what I could tell when I, I came in and and I'll talk a little bit more about it in specifics tomorrow about our medical system but it generally results in you having to take a, a big fork in the road, do a U-turn, you know, backtracking or whatever what you did and redoing work. Um, so it was inefficient use of resources um, by go by jumping into a whole lot of things straight up without having you know a clearly defined scope and plan. And I suppose another good reason is that you your risk management strategies, just so you can identify at those levels when you need to to make drastic action. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think, you know, we, at the Institute, we test bedded. And I don't think there's any problem in test bedding, you know? So you run a draft, it's a draft effectively what you're doing. That's okay, like you can run a draft. That might help you work out what scope is. That might help you understand better what smart base capability is. Because until you've built a few forms, done a few things with people, it's quite hard to rationalize how is this really going to fit, even to lead the discussion with the management and things and what they can get use out of. So some, you know, building, sandpitting and just getting your hands dirty, I think you, you, you just need to get my hands dirty. Like You do need to get your hands dirty, but then you have to stop getting your hands dirty at some point and say, actually, now we need direction, we know what we're playing with, now where is that going to go? And so, and at what point do you stop just sandpitting and actually this one is going to be, like, kind of get a lot of arms and legs, at what point do I control those arms and legs and make sure it can work? It's a risk on cost and I suppose even yeah. financial where I think we're guilty of it a lot at the iOS in the past is um, uh, software's bought very uh, it's it's feature driven when you, when you buy something you see something looks pretty cool so you invest in it um, but you you don't sort of take the time to make sure it's requirement driven when you're doing your purchase um, which is essentially your scope so well then I'm sure we've got lots of software sitting around that's been there for five ten years that uh, because it doesn't get reviewed and there's no scope to it keeps living may not get used so much but um, we're probably paying too much in terms of maintenance fees and things like that for it so 
Once again, it, it, it's easier if you have that scope at the start to sort of track that, that investment and whether the benefits are there that you're getting out of it. Right. What have you seen work well and not so well in terms of gaining compliance from firstly the athletes? Brent, do you want to do that one? Yeah, no worries. Um, I'll probably talk about the staff first. Um, as maybe some of you probably know, we've just had a change in coaching uh, group over the last year and a bit. Um, so originally we've had a lot of staff, um, a lot of coaches that have known how to use the system and some new coaches have come in and they're obviously they haven't been upskilled um, and some of the issues we've had with um, compliancy across the new coaches is that um, they're very happy using another program called Keynote um, and so there's another step involved um, if we're going to ask them to input data into SmarterBase, we're going to have to transfer it from Excel to Keynote. So that's one of the compliancy issues that we have um, with our coaches because they're very happy using the Mac side um, rather than the PC. Um, in terms of the athletes, um, they've become fairly compliant over time. I mean, we've been using the software for four years now. Um, and initially it's always hard to create change within an organisation, um, but that comes with culture as well. So um, our older players, um, once they're brought into using the actual software, and using the apps, um, our younger players have followed. And then obviously you um, have to make it as easy as possible for these athletes to use as well. They're very simple humans. <laughs> um, and they like to use their phone all the time, so having the app and making sure that's very functional and easy to use is imperative. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's one of the big things that seems to get asked for a lot, even at AIS, is that a compliance report is a big thing they ask for. It's something uh, Spotfire have done as well for us. Now. So, Steve, do you have anything there? Make sure that the the team, the staff who's working with the athletes gives a lot of feedback to the athletes about what they are entering. Because if they don't see a purpose to what they're doing, compliance really will fall off. And uh, it's, it's really important to engage with the, the sports science staff, for example, if it's a training form, to make sure that you know they're going to, in the daily training environment, let the athletes know that what they're entering really is making a difference. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more there actually. A lot of people have come up to, to us even and are going, like we're entering this data, but what do we get out of it? Mm -hmm. We don't know we do this and that's the coaches for that. I'm just adding, just we have very good compliance with <coughs> athlete buy-in <coughs> well, games. Many of you all know about the whereabouts process of going into a game so drugs don't be controlled. And the chase up for the chief medical officers is to find out exactly where the athletes are at a given moment of time. <coughs> not for the game's window, but for two weeks beforehand. So we built into Smarter Base through the mobile app application for the athletes that they can log in, do their whereabouts process on that, as well as their medical questionnaire for the game, so I was able to tackle two things at the same time. And the back end of that was I then produced essentially a report that I filed in the Commonwealth Games Federation for our whereabouts for the whole uh, Scottish team going into Glasgow. And that was literally a touch of a button. So once I knew I'd hit all 310 athletes, uh, about 317 for reserves and everything, that was fed in. The one sport where uh, management got in the way was boxing. The assumption that the boxer didn't know how to use phone. <laughs> athletes know how to use phones. They constantly they walk like this, as you know, they walk in street lamps and all sorts. So the boxers knew how to do it, but the management turned around and said, no, no, we'll do it for them. But just to show in terms of actually buying, if it's something like that going into a tournament where they have to be buying this, we'd use this as a really useful tool and very quickly produces the reports that we need for the wider organisation of that actual tournament. Uh, so just proves that it does work. Yeah. I'm going to jump in there with a rant, sorry. Um, I, know I, I know I wasn't invited to this one. But he just couldn't talk. I've had a few conversations with people today about this great topic, and then I've got a little bit of an analogy thing, and I'm going to do the carrot and stick thing, I think that's the other way. 
it comes down to carrots and sticks and working out. And we have five different rules. You know, sometimes you've got to take away the carrots and sticks. But even then, you, you <coughs> think the key is you need to work out what are the carrots and what are the sticks. It's not just about using a carrot or a stick, it's what are the carrots, what are the sticks. So a couple of examples. Let's say you've got um, let's say you've got athletes that you're trying to get engaging with uh, a wellness question, your daily wellness, daily monitoring. Now again, what, what's the carrot you can offer them? Okay? It could be um, <coughs> be uh, some sort of extrinsic, and you're either going to psychology, intrinsic versus extrinsic rewarding and things like that. Um, intrinsic usually being stronger. So you could financially reward them for doing their wellness over 80% compliance or something like that. Mm -hmm. If they're going to work with a guy getting paid a million dollars a year, how much you need him? You know, probably not. Um, what about then if you, um, as on that form, you, you build into the form uh, a compliance counter. So as they're entering it, you get to the end of the week, you cut a weekly report, just quick group entry, weekly report, that fires alerts to any players who have graded any percent compliance with a summary for the week of their wellness. So they get something back immediately, bang, there's a return. And that's an intrinsic reward. It's three clicks on Starterbase, and it's done. So, so you've given them a really good carrot. If they don't comply, they don't get it. Well, I'm an athlete, and I'm, 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 I'm missing out on this important information. That's a good carrot. Um, now, uh, in terms of sticks as well, it's the flip side of that. So, you know, we, we had some client, uh, again, pro footy client, who was trying to drive the wellness, right? And again, same thing, trying to drive compliance. Now, um, in terms of then pulling out a stick on them, again, what, they, what could they do? Okay, if you don't hit 80% compliance, we're going to find you $1,000. So, what? A million dollars a year, whatever. Now, what, if, what they then did was they built a, an Excel live report. We call it that next simple Excel live report. Again, pulls those compliance rates from the wellness form. And when they walk in the weights room, they're sitting there on a plasma screen. And if they haven't done it today, their name's read. If they're under 80% this week, their name's read. There's a red thing, there's a red thing, there's even an automatic text thing which says, you know, if they're under 50%, you're a donkey, for example. No, but I mean, and that's. So that's a stick, but it's a, it's a peer pressure stick. So they're getting, they walk in there and their colleagues are saying, no, we can give you donkey. So again, it's, a, it's, it's using a, it's an effective stick, because even they're making a million bucks a year, they don't want to be shamed out and singled out in front of their big peers. So again, I think it's based on your population you're working with, work out the carrots, work out the sticks, and then implement <coughs> and what was the possible to I just know another good one is just the ability to have that offline mode. So even when teams are travelling overseas, you can actually still log into a mobile app offline, have them do it on the bus while they're travelling, and still be catching their compliance as well. Uh, external providers. What challenges have you faced with regards to external providers, and what have you done to overcome these challenges? Who's got some external providers? I know you had some. Yeah, Institute has external providers in a variety of places, so contracted physios. Uh, we have performance systems that are external to us, uh, etc. Um, challenges. Most of it's around understanding, um, and some of it is around also, I mean, you're, so you're basically almost asking staffing compliance at that part, so in terms of um, data entry and things like that. So in physio worlds and sometimes I think medical worlds, it's, it's duplication of effort for them. In terms of the institute, um, you don't get paid if you don't like kind of fulfil on those sides. Also, it's getting something back for them too. And so I think where 
um, that environment has achieved success in people that weren't um, real happy in duplicating previously and are now happy to do it is where they're actually getting direct feedback about that athlete in their environment and it's actually changing their decisions on how they treat and so the system is now seen to be adding value and it's actually coming back full first in that they're asking why aren't our systems doing x y and z so is this system that the institute is doing is, is doing x y and z so it's about being really good at, 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 I, I guess what the product does and things um, so it's, it's twofold um, but I, if anybody's going to work within a system it has to be done a certain way and so trying to get get that from an external most of it's understanding it's kind of, and, and they seem to be a value contributor I think yep. Todd, you're also trying to get many yeah. uh, from many external places. Yeah, um, so it's sort of sports specific, probably a good example, uh, similar to what Sue was saying. Uh, we had Rowing Australia who were trying to push out all their medical and physiotherapy uh, Australia wide, and they have obviously a lot of external service providers. So the main challenge for them was just the training aspect. Uh, they got a physio who maybe sees one of the athletes once a month, twice a month. They still need to be educated to a similar level you know, in terms of putting in the notes and understanding what uh, you know injury statuses were and what treatments and where they should go uh, nearly to the same level as a physio who might use it every day and see multiple roles so uh, to get around that they, they sort of organise some, some group seminar sessions for them a lot of online web um, viewings, education once again it's just reviews and reviews and listening to their issues and their problems and holding their hand a lot of the times but we really need to be driven out hard by the chief medical officer at rowing uh, and also sort of the, the head of physiotherapy so they had a good goal but they wanted to get a certain amount um, done in sort of small chunks states at a time um, I wouldn't say they're at 100 percent they may be at maybe 80 percent compliance with the service providers um, but hopefully over time for them will be that greater push when those other external providers can maybe learn off the other ones who are doing it too. So, yeah. well, that's probably been the main challenge just with the education of the system yep. and the time involved in it. Any other comment? Right, so project management, we've got some this is the big one, this is what Todd Ryle 2014 <laughs> All software projects uh, are about issue management. What systems were put in place to manage issues and task management? So AIU and um, AIS both use a product called JIRA for logging the issues. I know it works really well for AIS. Uh, Simon, you were saying maybe not all that useful for, for AIU? Yeah, the, and JIRA is good in terms of provides you an opportunity to log issues um, against certain aspects of the system. Uh, I found just in, in how we operate, where it, it's just me internally building, um, and then it's you know, essentially just Kirill most of the time doing it building from Fusion side, but emails between us was fast enough um, because our staff in franchise also just email me that they're not going to go to a different system to log an issue. Um, so yeah, I get some use out of it. Todd probably gets a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Uh, Brent, just being a, a pro part, you were saying you, you weren't actually using anything, what system yeah, you were that, using? Yeah, that's correct. So we're not overly a huge club compared to the institutes um, around the world. So theoretically, emails are quicker, and they're always directed to me, and um, generally I can deal with uh, the issues um, and problems that have arisen quite quickly, obviously in the spare time. Um, but yeah, we've had no need for any sort of task management software. Yep. Yep. Same here. I just use a form and smarter base and we use email. Yeah, okay. Another good one. Smarter can be used for that. Um, I can give an iOS good start using smarter yeah, we did. We did the start, and I think there's isn't there a smarter base? Yeah, so in our local own client one or something. Yeah, you can CRM, you track know, things. Yeah. We just make a little form. And yeah. yeah, we have yeah. a fairly nice like kind of um, form, like kind of it's a a, a a new requests and problem notifications form. 
It sends alerts out to the people champion as well as to the builders. Um, if it's a new user interface, it actually sends an alert out to uh, the admin staff as well for the appropriate area. And so it goes to potentially three or four people where it's uh, an email if it was just coming in to somebody like myself for me to have to manage the emails. Also, by doing it that way, um, it tags an uh, importance, it tags a timeline, and it also tags um, um, notification and resolution, so it actually tracks the change in, in the process of it. And so people keep getting notified when that problem's been updated, it's reviewed and it's completed. So through the Smart Averse Alerting System, it means that everybody's notified as, as that one goes through. So I found that a really helpful and streamlined um, the problems and issues that are coming through massively. And it means it goes to the right place and they don't all come to me um, or the other builders in the site and they go to other places and it sort of divvies it out in a very nice way. So I found yeah, if I, could, sorry, if I could just tell them on what Sue's talking about there, um, they've been working closely together with this kind of site for the last four or so years. We found that that workflow, doing all the project management, problem notification, new task requests from the user base, really powerful in the smart base because there were a number of instances where either I was on paternity leave, or Sue was on leave, or Sue had annual leave, or concrete. And having all of that documented in a central place where if Sue was not reachable, I could then go and have a look at what are the current common notifications that needed to get done this week. So even just having visibility of it, even if I wasn't or necessarily needed to action it, meant that in a case of an emergency, if Sue was not reachable, it's all documented there so to, to be, um, be referenced again. And even whilst Sue was on leave just recently, and I'm here in Australia, the builders in Scotland, Dan and Andrew, are working together. And every single time a change happened with one of those tasks or a problem, I was getting all the email notifications, so it just automatically being kept in the loop, just because I'm an important member of the project. Um, and still, even though I'm not directly resolving the issues, I still need to be made aware. Um, which has just been quite invaluable just, um, just, you know, um, from a risk management point of view as well. So, that was just what I was going to say. Yeah, all right. Carol, I really want to keep this door to the top and uh, ask you to tell mm. how you were using JIRA to actually get the wire from the board, get more wire from the users by showing them the JIRA prison current issues we're working on, JIRA resolution time schemes issues. One of the benefits of tracking issues and tracking them well is that you get lots of data out of it that you can then come back with to people who initially ask for these things to be fixed and argue your point in terms of how you manage the project. So, do you like mm. that? We'll go on with that now. Oh, yeah, you've got one. Go on. Up to one. Um, 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 yeah, uh, big. Big one to talk about probably on that one, Kirill. Um, we <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so with issue management, it's, it's like everyone said here, and everyone who's implementing software does it. So it's all it's all just the tracking of the issue. It's not what program you use, what technology. Um, you can write it on a bit of paper and stick it up on a wall like I think QAs do. So our methodology is all around this this Scrum-based system. Um, big one used by by IT, but also manufacturing um, units. Really simple framework where we basically get each of the sports to prioritise all their tasks. So, like Blanchy, Blanchy sends me five emails a day, minimum, hey? all these things to do. So, <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, so we, we, we form what's called like a, a backlog of lists of all these things to um, do what Swimming Australia want. And then I'll sit down with, with Blanchy and he'll prioritise everything from top to bottom. We'll then sit down with our builders, we'll no sort of negotiate how much of that chunk of that prioritised list that we're going to achieve um, within that month. And then we're basically just working towards that, but anything Blanchy's coming in, he keeps hitting me for stuff, I just keep putting it <coughs> on the backlog, and, but we will concentrate purely. It's sort of another whole day subject. <laughs> Yeah.
So if we, if we get an issue from a sport and it's going to take top priority, that's fine. We might put it up there, but then we might say to the sport, that's, that's all well and good, but you're going to lose sort of this, this piece that we were planning to do for, for the week. Uh, that's what that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we might wrap it up there then. Um, plenty to talk around the pool tonight about project management, obviously. <laughs> um, I think, uh, like Sue said, a um, very first stop point was each journey is unique. And you really just need to figure out what is right for your organisation and just keep revisiting and make sure you have a plan in place for the correct implementation. Um, does anyone have any quick questions? Why do you have that? We'll hand back over to Marcus, we'll thank our panel. Thank you very much.